Okay, so I'm Hi. ready to go. Yep. Okay. So I'm calling to order the Ad Hoc Sustainability and Resilience Committee of the Common Council. Today's April 14th, 2022. Um, of the committee members right now, we have Tom Keegan with us, Tom Livingston, Dominique Johnson, uh, myself, Lisa Shanahan. We're expecting Josh Goldstein to arrive shortly and I'll, um, I'll mention him when he does come. And then we're um, other committee members, if they join us, I will call them when they come. So that's our roll order. I don't, a roll call. I don't believe we have anybody for public participation. Right, Katie, you don't see anybody? I do not. Um, I'm okay. sorry, yes, I do. One person. Okay, um, if they want to be heard, they can raise their hands now. Otherwise, we'll continue with the approval of the minutes. His name is Matt. Matt, do you want to be heard for public participation? Didn't raise his hand. Nope. Okay. So we'll keep moving on. Um, approval of the minutes for our first meeting, March 8th, 2022. Um, do I have a motion to approve the minutes as they are provided from Ms., uh, Mr. Livingston makes that motion. Does anybody have any changes or amendments to the minutes they'd like to make? Oh, Mr. Goldstein has arrived. So we can note that at, at 6.05, he's joined us. Um, I just have one um, tiny correction on, um, I guess it would be page three of the minutes. In the third paragraph, it says, um, Mr. Witchell said, this is your work. And if he does his job right, people will feel, not fall. Or fall. Oh. <laughs> so that's the only change I would make. Um, no, Jennifer, no um, looking at the minutes, do you have any changes to the minutes that you would like to make? No, that's a no. <laughs> okay, so um, with that one amendment, can I have, um, Mr. Livingston's made a motion to approve the minutes, all in favor. All righty, we have uh, five votes that they approve as, they're approved as amended. Our next piece of business is, um, well, I guess what I'll do is, Brian, I'm gonna turn it over to you to introduce our two speakers and we can um, have a conversation. But first I'm gonna give you a chance to brag. <laughs> <laughs> okay, um, let me see. So yeah, so we have like received some good news this week. I think some of you are aware. Oh, Brian, can uh, I interrupt you for one yeah, second yeah. to do this? Katie, would you mind sending um, Darlene the link? Yes, and if you send it that right now. A cell phone that would be great. Do you have her cell phone number? Um, I'll put it in okay, the yeah. um, chat. Okay, thanks. Okay, okay, there you go. Um, Brian, right. you're no back. Problem. Yeah, so I just wanted to update you all. I think some of you may be aware we were fortunate to receive a six million dollar grant from the state of Connecticut. Uh, this is for infrastructure improvements around the South Norwalk train station, really coming out of our TOD planning effort with some good implementation dollars, which seldom happens. So we're very excited about that. And I think a big component that's relevant to this group is the amount of green infrastructure we worked into the proposal. So obviously looking for opportunities to integrate bike uh, lanes, pedestrian, enhanced pedestrian facilities, and then sort of uh, maybe some bioswales and more green features around the train station, which I think are much needed. Um, so we're very excited about that. We pulled together a pretty innovative financing plan. We were able to um, get six million from the state with some creative sources of you know use of land, uh, different mechanisms which we'll go over, I guess at subsequent council meetings um, to get that money uh, to Norwalk. Uh, and also I could update you. We just submitted about an hour ago for the raise program. So this we submitted last year. We were unsuccessful, uh, but we got a positive debrief from USDOT. It's for similar work, but to really expand the sustainability and equity components of that project around South Norwalk. So we'll be looking at uh, $14 million we've requested from the federal government. So fingers crossed on that. We're supposed to know by August if we do receive those funds. Uh, in terms of sustainability on that one, it's actually a, a large component to put solar on the commuter parking garage. Um, so it'll be sort of a self-sufficient facility, uh, doing a lot of intelligent transportation systems to make the bus transit facilities a little bit better. Uh, and then also expanding commuter parking and then more green infrastructure. So really trying to fold in all the work and we, you know, all the discussions we've had into our USDOT and transportation infrastructure proposals. I've had a lot of experience doing that. And I find that, you know, there's larger dollars available for transportation infrastructure. So if you're able to piggyback green infrastructure and green investment, you can really make it go a lot further, you know? So I think it's uh, very exciting and fingers crossed and hopefully in August we'll have some good news. That's great, Brian. Maybe we can be a good example for other parts of the city with that parking and solar combo. Yeah, definitely. I think it'll be a big win. <clears throat> All righty. Well, thanks for sharing that information. And now we can move on to your friend, John, who's joined us. Yeah, great. So yeah, so we are, um, one thing we wanted to do today is just kind of catch up the whole committee on 
you know, things that are ongoing in the city in terms of sustainability. There's a lot of good that's happening behind the scenes. We want to bring that to the top here. So we're all aware and, you know, benefiting from each other. So the first uh, speaker tonight is John Trusinski. Um, he is the director of resilience planning from Circa. And he's going to go over some of the work he's been doing with Resilient Connecticut and how that's going to play out here in South Norwalk. So with that, I will turn it to John, who I believe you have some slides for us. Yeah, thanks, Brian. Um, yeah, I've got a couple of slides and, uh, you know, I'll try to make this brief. Um, but, you know, I uh, appreciate the opportunity to just kind of talk about and give a little context to this work um, that we've been doing at Circa with this Resilient Connecticut project. Um, as well as another initiative that we've been uh, kind of discussing with the city to uh, do some research around temperature um, uh, and measure temperatures in different parts of the city. Um, so I'll, I'll just talk a little bit about each of those initiatives. Um, so again, my name is John Chazinski. I work for Circa. Um, you know, I've, I've mainly been working on this Resilient Connecticut project for, for the last several years. Um, and Circa, you know, for those of you who are not familiar, um, you know, we're a research institute. We're um, situated within the marine science program at UConn. Um, our office is at Avery Point, but we work uh, with different groups across the university. We work with uh, some researchers at UConn Law and the School of Engineering and um, we also partner with other institutions like Yale um, and uh, other academic institutions. And basically, you know, we're, we're, our mission is to, to provide guidance and support for planning uh, for the state. We work a lot with the state agencies um, the off in the governor's office, um, as well as municipalities um, across the state. Um, and this, this project, Resilient Connecticut, um, it really goes back to 2016 or so, and it was, it was part of a grant that the state of Connecticut received uh, through the HUD National Disaster Resilience Competition. Um, and that really grew out of uh, this project, Resilient Bridgeport. And uh, Brian, I know you were, you were involved in some of the early phases of that. Um, and, uh, you know, Resilient Bridgeport was really a series of pilot projects in the south end of Bridgeport that uh, came out of the planning process after Sandy. Um, and, and a lot of the grant funding through this grant um, went to uh, Bridgeport to do an implementation uh, for those projects that included uh, a flood defense system around the South End, um, included some, some green infrastructure and a stormwater park, uh, included uh, elevating some key roadways in the, in the South End. Um, and a resilience center actually for the for the community for residents to shelter in place and and to provide a community uh, asset. Um, and then resilient Connecticut was this other piece, which is basically to do a regional plan for Fairfield and New Haven counties and kind of take the take some of the the prototypes and some of the ideas from resilient Bridgeport and that that planning process and basically look for other opportunities across Fairfield and New Haven counties. Um, and, you know, as part of that, we, Circle was involved to kind of develop some of the technical support um, and, and do some of the vulnerability assessment part of it. Um, and it was really, a, a lot of it was a, a partnership with the state agencies. Um, and, uh, you know, a lot of the initial grant grew out of that. But ultimately, the goal was to come up with other places to develop pilot projects using that similar approach, um, uh, some, of, some of those features. And this was a little bit of the division, you know, some of the principles that were involved in that uh, from, from the resilient Bridgeport perspective and how we sort of were thinking about it. Um, you know, these were kind of some of the, 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 the goals of, you know, what, what is a resilient community in Connecticut look like? And it really had a focus around TOD, you know, and, and looking at opportunities for TOD, um, where TOD is, is happening and making sure that uh, we're making investments to make those opportunities more resilient. Um, and also, you know, thinking about these corridors that are resilient to climate change. So um, something we call resilient corridors. Um, and that's really just, you know, whether through our intervention or whether through identification of, of higher ground and kind of connecting the low-lying flood zones to higher ground. Um, we also had a focus on affordable housing um, and uh, equity and, and social vulnerability uh, were key components of uh, you know what we were looking at. 
Um, so this was a little bit of the, the framework in the, uh, that guided the planning process. Uh, so, so phase two was a, a big part of it. It was a three phase project and, and phase two happened mostly over 2021. And uh, this is where we partnered with the four COGS um, in Fairfield and New Haven counties. And um, we did a, a series of workshops in 2021 in January and May. Um, and we did a vulnerability assessment uh, across the two counties. And our main focus was to, to kind of look at flooding and, and look at extreme heat and, and look at where there are vulnerabilities, particularly where you see that, that intersection of, of those other things from, from the framework, like affordable housing and TOD. Um, so, so that's what we were doing um, in phase two of the project. Um, this was just an example of some of, you know, kind of looking at flooding, some of the analysis that went into the vulnerability assessment um, from South Norwalk. And, and this was, you know, the, the purple area is basically the FEMA flood zone. Uh, the pink areas, areas where, um, you know, when we look at sea level rise uh, and, you know, our, our, our planning for 20 inches of sea level rise by 2050, where do we see some uh, potential for, for that to impact the flood zone? Um, and start to do an analysis of, of the parcels and the structures and critical infrastructure. Um, and so, you know, South Norwalk was one of the lo locations when we looked across the two counties that um, looks like it has a lot of flood risk. Um, and so it's someplace that we want to we want to prioritize and focus some attention on uh, for that reason. And the way we we uh, worked this in was this concept of zones of shared risk. Um, and again, this was going back to the framework that sort of guided the process. And it was really um, looking at a way of identifying common risks between different land uses in people and communities, and then how they sort of connect into the these larger uh, zones. And, and South Norwalk was an area where you have these these several distinctive. Uh, zones that have their own characteristics of flood risk and then fit into this larger um, this larger zone. So this th this was this idea of zones of shared risk that we tried to to bring uh, and and we we mapped these out across the two counties. There were over 600 that we mapped across Fairfield and New Haven counties. Um, as far as the heat risk, so this was something that that gained started to gain importance as we went along. Um, and we started to take some initial steps to sort of look at vulnerability. And this was one of the tools that, that was done. And it's something we call the Climate Change Vulnerability Index. It's basically an index mapping tool, right? So it's indexing across uh, Fairfield and New Haven counties. And it's looking at um, primarily through satellite imagery and looking at the, the emissivity of surfaces that we see in satellite images where we see uh, particularly hot areas. Um, you know, they, they tend to be in, in some of the urban areas, but we also intersected that with um, uh, some of the socioeconomic data and the demographic data from the census uh, data and, and tried to bring these together where we see heat islands and where we see uh, potentially uh, vulnerable populations. And again, uh, South Norwalk was one of the places when we looked across the two counties that looks like it has a, a particular vulnerability to heat. Um, that we need to pay attention to. Um, we also did some, some social vulnerability mapping and we sort of, we did a hybrid approach where we took, uh, there's a few different approaches out there that the CDC has. And there's one from the University of South Carolina called the SOVI index um, that uses a bunch of different demographic factors. Again, this is using um, the best available data that we have, which is census data. And this is basically census block groups and it's an index tool. So it's, it's indexing between all the different census block groups in the two counties. And again, you know, South Norwalk shows up as a place that has some, some particular social vulnerability. Um, so we, we bring all that together. We have the, the flood risk, we have the TOD in the, in the infrastructure, we have the, the heat vulnerability, we have the social vulnerability. And, and that's how we sort of define this idea of a resilience opportunity area. Um, and these were places that we 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 flagged through those those workshops, and um, it was around this time when we started to have conversations with uh, Steve and Laura uh, from the planning department who participated in some of those workshops, and uh, you know we started having some initial discussions about um, you know what the city is doing as far as planning, what what's going on with the hazard mitigation plan. Um, you know, where 
where does the city want to go with the with the resilience plan and, and how might we be able to help um, within sort of the scope of our our our, our regional plan. Um, and so some of the uh, initial, um, or I guess these are just some of the highlights, you know, that I mentioned, um, we, we did the workshops and those were in partnership with the West Cog in January and May. Um, we started to have some discussions with, um, with, with Steve and Laura who connected us with uh, some other folks um, within the city staff. Um, we did a site visit back in August as part of that kickoff for the, uh, the industrial waterfront study. Um, in the meantime, Circa has been um, meeting with the state agencies and the Safer Council, which is kind of advising us on this project overall. Um, and then we started to develop a scope of work and sort of confirm uh, whether Norwalk wanted to participate in this, this process potentially. And so now we're, we're moving into what we call phase three of the, pro uh, of the project, which is basically going back to that original idea you know where where can we develop uh, additional pilot projects um, in in Fairfield and New Haven counties, sort of using that framework. And um, you know, so we are hoping and, and planning to uh, work with you all. Um, one of seven projects in Phase Three of Resilient Connecticut. Um, and so you know, that's sort of where we are at, at this point. Um, so maybe I'll just take a breath um, and see if you want me to go. I have a few slides to just talk about what the scope of work for this project would be, uh, but I, you know I want to be mindful of uh, you have other speakers and in your time. So I'm happy to answer questions or, or keep going for for another couple minutes. Hey John, I think it would be great if you keep going because like we're all in about the South Norwalk resiliency. This is really important to us. So yeah, we're and we have time. We've got and you know it's only seven twenty or six twenty. Can okay. I ask a question? Can sure. You talk more about what you mean by social vulnerability. Yeah. So social vulnerability essentially is a concept that um, I believe it was originally developed by the CDC, um, but it, it's come in, increasingly it's it's become uh, relevant to a climate context. And I think you know, in plain words, it's basically. You know, are there uh, factors related to income uh, or political power traditionally or or different social factors that essentially make it harder for people to adapt to um, to either flooding or different impacts? Um, so, you know, we've and it's become more of a practice um, within the space of climate planning to, to not just think about where you have a lot of flooding and a lot of infrastructure, but you know, what are the populations of people that might have uh, challenges in adapting to those things or responding to those uh, those risks and hazards. Um, so that's where, you know, I think that's generally the idea. Thanks. I think there's a uh, Dominique has her hand. Oh, I do. Yes, thank you. And I just as a follow up to um... To Tom's question, thank you so much for this information. It's fabulous. Um, is there a focus when you all did this in Bridgeport? I assume that the industrial nature of the neighborhoods came into play. Perhaps that's also factored in in the social vulnerability index. Um, I think the industrial. Well, you know, you, you mean in terms of like environmental justice, or you know, kind of the that idea of the distribution of uh, environmental uh, pollution or hazards. Right, right, because we do have quite a bit of mixed zoning down in South Norwalk, as you know, with like contractor yards, um, businesses that that do have a lot of environmental hazards potentially to neighborhoods or even residences right next door. Yeah, I, um, it actually did not, you know, that sort of characterization of the the um, the burdens, environmental burdens of, of pollution and industrial activity, it didn't really work directly into that. Um, that's actually a project that Circa is working with uh, DEEP on is to do a mapping tool that kind of looks at that, um, specifically that issue. Um, but, uh, but you know, I think the thing that you find is actually that socioeconomic characteristics are pretty correlated with some of those things, you know, um, where we see, where we see lower income populations or places where, where there's a lot of industrial activity, a lot of impervious surface, and those tend to be places that are hotter, you know, when we look for for heat islands. So um, 
I, you know, I, I wouldn't say as, a, as a, a strict rule, but I think generally those those socioeconomic characteristics are kind of correlated with it. Totally, it's all connected. Thank you so much, John. Appreciate it. Great. So if you, if you will continue on, and then we can ask more questions at the end. Okay, no problem. Um, all right. So so moving into phase three and working in South Norwalk. Um, you know, what, what are we sort of proposing to do here? And, and this is the scope of work um, that, you know, we've been sharing with uh, the planning and zoning department and, and just kind of discussing and um, what we're proposing to do going forward. It's basically six tasks. Um, and, you know, task two is about stakeholder engagement, which is, a, you know, critical. Um, and the two major pieces of that is an advisory committee um, that, you know, the city would propose and we're, we're hoping that you all would kind of uh, help to take ownership of this and guide it. Um, and, uh, and then some public workshops. So we're proposing to do three public workshops, uh, one sort of at the beginning of, of the, the process, one in the middle, and then one at the end. Um, and then task three, this is something Circa is gonna work with a consultant team to, to look at sort of the, those climate conditions. Um, we want to look at current conditions, and then we want to look at future conditions. What is our best sort of scientific understanding of how flooding is going to change, how heat is going to change, um, and then, you know, kind of look at what the impacts might be. And then task four is where we get to this thing, which, uh, you know, we basically call, like, what are the options? You know, what are the, the options that are feasible, that are fundable, that you can get permits to, to do? And um, we want to be able to develop some some concepts and some concept design. Um, and then for some of those that we are actually moving towards projects, we want to do a benefit cost analysis. Uh, so include a, a BCA as part of the scope um, and really hopefully set these uh, projects up for um, you know federal funding programs, um, either through FEMA BRIC or the infrastructure funding or even through some of the, you know, it's great that you're going for the raise grant because um, that was another one that I, I, I've been hearing about and sort of intrigued by the potential. Uh, but it sounds like you, you have a pretty good uh, approach already. So hopefully this can just sort of feed into some of the, the, the stuff that you already have uh, on the table um, as far as projects. Um, and then I guess just a little bit more detail, detail about what we mean uh, for some of these um, you know, the, the current and future conditions, we want to look at, uh, you know, coastal flood risks, we want to look at stormwater flood risks um, at particular locations, um, adaptation options and the concept design, you know, this is pretty broad at this point, um, you know, but some of the ideas might be road elevations, um, it might be segments of flood protection systems. Uh, there might be particular, uh, particularly vulnerable community assets that we might, we might want to do site scale flood protection. Um, on the heat side, um, you know, you, a couple of you were just talking about trees. Um, you know, one of, one of the things that we find kind of initially from some of the analysis is that places with a lot of trees, it's, it seems really simple, but, um, you know, trees are extremely valuable at reducing the, the heat islands. Um, and reducing the vulnerability to heat. So, you know, what, part of what it could be is, is uh, a project that really focuses on developing the tree canopy in certain parts of the city. Um, so th there's a number of different things that we can, we can do, and we're not sort of being uh, re restrictive about it. We're, we're hoping that these consultant teams will bring their expertise and creativity to it, and that the stakeholder engagement will really guide the process of developing the projects. Um, I guess a couple of details on, uh, you know, further details. Um, we're hoping to kick this off in June of 2022, um, and we have to wrap things up on this this uh, this whole regional plan that I, I originally referenced by May of 2023. Uh, so it's about a 12 month uh, time frame. Uh, the the budget that we have for the consultant team is 150k. Um, and there'll be uh, quite a bit of circa staff time that'll be involved as well. Um, in addition to that, um, the next steps I think from from circus perspective uh, is to start to work on the advisory committee. You know, forming an advisory committee over this next month or so. 
Um, and then, you know, we have a pool of consultants that responded to an RFQ back in, uh, in phase two of the project. And um, so we put out an RFP with all the scopes of work for these, these seven projects that we're going to be working on. So we'll see what we get back. Um, the, the end date for the RFP is May 2nd. Um, so that's ongoing. And then, of course, we want to coordinate with whatever, you know, the city has planned in terms of, uh, you know, developing the climate action plan or some of the other initiatives. You know, we really kind of see this as um, we want this to be useful to the city. And, and this is really sort of something that we're hoping that you would take ownership of and it would uh, work into, you know, the city's plans more broadly. Um, and then very quickly, I'll just touch on uh, the other project that I, I briefly discussed and going back to this idea of the heat vulnerability. And again, this, this analysis was based off of satellite imagery, which really just looks at the surfaces um, that we see in the images. Um, so it's the roadways, the, the building rooftops, and it, you know, it's, it's kind of a proxy for where there are heat islands. And you would be amazed at how hot the surfaces of you know, the roofs and the roads actually get when you do an analysis. You know, this, it's like 130, 140 degrees and some of the surfaces. Um, so what we wanna do is we wanna take the next step, which is actually like understand what the residents are actually feeling um, at ground level. And the way we are proposing to do that is to uh, deploy some temperature sensors throughout the city. And this was a project, uh, or this is a research approach that we, we piloted in New Haven last summer. Um, and this summer, we are proposing to do it in Norwalk and Danbury. Um, and my colleague, Yaprak, has been, um, you know, having some discussions with, uh, you know, the city health department and, and Brian and, and Yella. Um, and they've been really kind of guiding potential locations where we can deploy these sensors. They're, they're non-invasive, they just use a, a hose clamp and they attach to like a pole or a tree. And then we collect the temperature and humidity data over you know, the hot summer months. And then um, we can use that to start to actually uh, measure you know, different parts of the city, um, what uh, residents are actually feeling during, during heat waves and hot weather. Um, so that's another initiative that we hope will actually support, you know, the process of the, 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 the consultants are, are proposing projects that would get at uh, mitigating heat. Um, you know, this data would also be available for that as well. Um, and that's, that's sort of a picture of, uh, you know, one of the, the heat sensors in New Haven and what they look like. Do you um, do that all over the city for comparison purposes or just in South Norwalk in this case? In this case, we'll do it uh, throughout the city. Yeah, because we're really looking for a mix of um, land uses and different kinds of development, you know, where we see uh, uh, parks with a lot of trees versus, uh, you know, uh, places with a lot of impervious surface and industrial activity, uh, places with dense housing, et cetera. Um, so I think we're, we're proposing to do, do it throughout the city. Gotcha, thanks. Uh, this is the website. There's tons of maps and, you know, lots of images of people pointing at maps uh, that you can find there. Um, and uh, I think that's, that's it. Happy to answer any questions or, or talk about the either of these further. Can you tell us a little bit more about the advisory committee that you're looking for and who would be the perfect people in your mind to populate that a committee like that? Yeah, that's a good question. I mean, I from you all know your community better than 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 I do or we do, you know. So I think it's really about um, like getting a mixture of different perspectives. I, I think you know this is where we start to get into like local politics and the dynamics of of you know uh, of the city that I think um, you would be best positioned to sort of who should be who should be involved and who should be guiding the process. I think. Um, you know, equity is obviously, uh, it's a big topic and it's something that we are thinking about and we want to incorporate it in. Um, and, you know, we want to think about making sure that uh, people who, uh, who you feel need to be a part of the planning process are a part of it. Um, and so, 
you know, but I, I think we we need some some guidance from from you all on on who should be involved. Mr. Kleppen looks like he's got an idea. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Um, so I don't have names, but I did send a kind of um, makeup list per kind of constituency or organization to Leisha a couple of weeks ago. So we haven't had a chance to circle back on that. I had also sent her a list of, regarding the affordable housing plan too. So I sent her two lists. So I'm sure she's kind of racking her brain on that. I'm happy to forward that on to you guys to take a look at too. I, I did have members, of, you know, not names, but um, representation from this group as well as I know planning and zoning is really interested in this. Um, obviously redevelopment is um, DPW, so um, health and human services, as well as, as John just mentioned, neighborhood input as well, because there's people that are actually living this, so they would definitely be good to get their input as well. John, can you give us some examples of some of the programs that you did in um, Bridgeport with, um, you know, similar to what you're suggesting for Norwalk? Yeah, sure. And actually, uh, you know, Brian might want to want to chime in because, uh, you know, the resilient Bridgeport, um, a lot of that sort of visioning came out of the rebuild by design, um, which happened after Sandy. And then this goes back to like 2014, 2015. You know, the basic components of that project are, like I said, that, you know, they're basically building a levee system around the south end. Um, and the levee system is supposed to reduce the flood risk and um, actually changed the flood map, the FEMA flood map. So they're going for a revision of the FEMA map. Um, and then the other pieces of it are they're elevating University Avenue uh, within the neighborhood, which is a, a low lying road that floods. Um, and then, like I said, there's a, there's a stormwater park that includes some green infrastructure, includes some traditional um, uh, gray infrastructure. And that is is meant to reduce the flood risk behind the levee. And then also it's a water quality benefit to um, in terms of the green infrastructure. The community was very involved in uh, developing the idea for the resilience center. Um, and uh, so that's a key piece of the project. Uh, but there was actually a whole plan for the city that was done uh, through, re through rebuild by design. And this was one component that then ended up, um, you know, getting this funding. Um, so those are a few of them, but, you know, uh, Brian, I don't know if you want to chime in with the, any more context. Yeah, yeah. I think you, you know, pretty much well described the sort of green and gray infrastructure investments that came out of the rebuild by design or that application. But what I can't say to this group, and I think it was, what was so encouraging about, you know, hearing from John and his timeline, that whole rebuild by design effort before, prior to that is when we did that workshop, the workshop that you're all going to be doing. So I think it's all about momentum. And I think, you know, coming out of the workshop that we're talking about in May, going straight into John's work and then whatever work we're doing concurrent with planning and zoning is going to help move towards a similar, you know, status that Bridgeport had in order to apply for some of these grants. Um, you know, it was unfortunate, but also it was a blessing in disguise in terms of some of the resilient improvements with Sandy it got everyone's attention on something that's very important. So there's a lot of money that was made available. And I remember we were actually going for even a larger component of that, of uh, that uh, money that was available. So I think there'll be more to come on that, but I think the momentum that we're building right now is the most important ingredient that we have. Yeah, and if I'm right, one of the, um, and tell me if this isn't one of the projects that was involved, but isn't there like a bioswale thing that the children are involved in that um, came out of this same work too? So it really seems as though you've got the community involved in some of the solutions, which is, would be good for us as well. Um, yeah, I think there's a large community engagement component, education, and that's a whole piece of it. So I think we'll identify a lot of these things in our workshop and then carry them forward. Yeah. Are there other questions that people have before I, I have one more question? Did you really say, John, that we're going to expect 20 feet of sea rise by 252050? 20 inches. No, tw 20 inches. Oh, 20 inches. I was like, wait, <laughs> I must have misheard you. <laughs> okay, 20 inches. Okay, that's still horrible, though. Yeah, 20, 20 inches is my first floor, so. Yeah, exactly. 20 inches is, yeah, it's, uh, it doesn't sound like a lot. And as I have a whole presentation that looks at that and sort of like how it changes the frequencies of flooding, you know, like how often we get uh, moderate and major flooding, you know, that's the, that's the main impact that's going to come from that. Um, so we're really going to have to think about if there's something in the flood zone, we have to, we have to adapt it in some way. You know, it has to be either floodable or it needs to be protected from flooding. Um, so these are, it's definitely going to be challenging, you know. Um, 
So, but yeah, no, 20 inches, not 20 feet. Okay, but still 20 inches being a horrifying, a bad number, but 20 feet was really gonna blow my mind. Okay, good, I miswrote that down. Yeah. It's a challenge, but it's not uh, necessarily that the entire city is going to be underwater. You know, it's, it's uh, you know, the places that have flooding issues are going to become more chronic. I'll, I'll say that and, and are going to need to be focus, a focus uh, of the city. Great. Other questions? I only see the, um, the cartoon strip, so I don't see everybody's hands raised. So chime in if you have another question for John. Oh, there we are. Great. Well, thank you so much. That's really terrific. And I know we're looking forward to seeing what comes out of your work and how we can support it. Cool. Good. Well, I guess thank our, you. our next presenter is the Mr. Steve Kleppen back on mm. the, supporting us as always. Thank you, John. So, so the good news is I don't have anything to really to present. I'm just giving you some kind of updates and kind of uh, forward items from what uh, Brian and John were just going over. Um, so they both had mentioned, you know, the kind of next step things that are coming with the two, two efforts. Um, one of the big things our group has been talking about for a while is just overall coordination on all these things. I, I'm glad that th this committee is actually a good avenue to, you know, handle that. So I think if we can sort of work through you guys on, you know, making sure all these efforts are coordinated, that would be a big help on our end. Um, we, we talked briefly about the makeup of a, a committee to, you know, look at the circus study, which I think is, you know, obviously the, the next step. And I don't see why that can't come together within the next week or so. And then just get, there's a lot of people obviously interested in this. So I don't think you'll have a tough time finding uh, volunteers from all the different constitu constituencies that are um, that are going to be affected by this. A couple things that are going to, you know, so those are the next two steps, obviously, what we talked about. Other efforts that are going on, um, I think we're, we'll hopefully kind of come after that. Hopefully, the, this, the, the circus study, as John alluded to, will lead to, you know, further opportunity and further funding. We are also looking at a couple of different grant opportunities that, uh, you know, in, in the short term, one is due next week, which is a NIFWIF grant um, that, you know, we still have Laura for another week. So she's kind of putting the pieces and kind of coordinate, coordinating that for us. And what we're, we're looking at for that is kind of um, an overall coastal resiliency plan, which we're hoping to get funding for. So it'll kind of feed off a lot of the things that the circus study is going to do, but then look at the broader Norwalk coastline, because obviously, South Norwalk is where everything is mostly densely concentrated and a lot of the infrastructure is and a lot of the people, but there are a lot of other areas that are on the coastline that are affected by this. So we need to look at it from the broader perspective. So we're hoping that there'll be um, funding available for that. Oh, in a, a very similar program, we're looking at um, the potential for some habitat restoration off of Vets Park um, to enhance the, the shellfish bed. So we're working through with um, Public Works, through Wrexham Park, to, you know, to you know, get them on the same page, because obviously they're doing the park's master plan. So we want to make sure that this could dovetail into the work that they're doing. And this particular grant program would be really like a feasibility study to see, you know, what's involved with the habitat restoration for the shellfish beds. And is it feasible? What's involved in the city's end? Uh, we're, we're kind of optimistic that we'll go through. That, that grant's not due until the middle of May um, and Alexis in our office will be kind of putting that, the pieces together for that with, with partnerships, as I mentioned with Rex and Park, but with also with Harbor Management, as well as you know, Shellfish and a few of the other nonprofits that are working in the city. And then there's another um, Long Island Sound Grant program that we're also looking at, which we think would be another good fit in terms of our coastal resiliency planning um, that we're going to apply to, and that's a little bit later on in the year. So that's kind of the, the next stage effort with this. And, and John kind of hit on the climate action plan, which I think is a, a much bigger and broader city initiative that we need to think about. But all these efforts will feed into that. And they kind of are, you know, they're, the proceeding with them at one step at a time, I think is a good approach just based on the resources we have available, staff time, your time. Um, and it just makes sense to just do them in, in stages. I, I don't have anything prepared beyond that, but I just kind of wanted to give you an update about that. And I do believe next month, um, 
Michelle Andrisky from my office is going to come in and talk about some of the things that she's been working on with sustainable CT and also with um, UConn as well. So that, that's kind of the big picture things. Um, one thing I should offer to this committee is that um, along with Alexis, Louise Washer and Dick and I are good, Dick Harris and I are gonna go look at the salt marsh that they've made out in um, Bridgeport. I don't know whether or not you had anything to do with that, um, John. We have a date to go um, look at that work, which would be what's some of what's being proposed for the tip of Veterans Park. So I'll share that date with everybody on the committee. And if you can make it that day, great. The NIP with um, gentleman, um, Sean Roach is gonna give us a little tour. That'd be great. Uh, let us know what time, especially because I work uh, in Bridgeport. So oh, yeah. Oh, good. Because it's like, it, I want to say it's two or two 30 in the afternoon. We thought later in the day would be a better thing to do, but I'll, I'll share it with everybody. Um, Cause it would be cool to see what they did. And um, Alexis is looking at it for purposes of this grant. Cool. Excellent. Do we have other questions of some of the work that the city's doing that anybody would like to ask Steve about? Well, it sounds like you answered all our questions, Steve. <laughs> a little quicker than last night's program. <laughs> Great. Well, um, thanks everybody. I think, you know, we're done at 6.45. So um, that's great. People can get on to their next meetings. Steve, um, Tom Keegan can get some dinner before he has his seven o'clock. <laughs> run on fumes. Um, John and Steve, thanks so much for joining us tonight. We really appreciate your updates and we're excited for the work that both sets are doing. It's fantastic. And Brian, as always, thank you to you and Katie for um, staffing us and getting us these wonderful speakers. Great, thanks Katie. <laughs> Good, so I will, um, I'll share Sorry. the date um, with everybody about the um, Salt Marsh um, field trip and then we'll take it from there. Do you wanna give us any update, Brian, about how the climate workshop um, yeah. So yeah. So um, as you all probably know, we're doing the climate workshop on May 26th. The invite has gone out. Uh, obviously, it's a select group given the sort of size constraints that we have for the facilitator and the discussion. Uh, we received 21 RSVPs. Uh, there's a, a survey too that we're going to look into. Actually, our survey admin was the one also responsible for pulling together our raise grant. So I had to have <laughs> them sort of focus on that. But I'll send an update once we start getting some more uh, responses back on that and what we hear. Um, but that'll be good. We're really looking forward to it and starting this, you know, building that momentum that we we're talking about tonight. Great. Good. So if nobody has anything else, I'll entertain a motion to adjourn. Mr. Goldstein, thank you. All right, all. Thank you again. Thank you, John and Steve, especially for um, lengthening your days with us. We appreciate it. Thank right. you. Thank you. Welcome. Thank you. Good night. Good night. Good night. night.